Hi, everyone. I'm Marvin. I'm a PhD student in Philips Group, and I work on partial differential equations and Gaussian processes. But today, I'll tell you a little bit about uh, numerical linear algebra, and also will commence with uh, which, what will be a relatively deep dive into numerical linear algebra for machine learning and Gaussian processes in particular. So there will be mostly two parts to today's lecture. Um, first of all, we're going to take a bit of a step back and look at the bigger picture and uh, answer the question why we should even care about numerical linear algebra in the first place. Um, and then we'll see some fundamental tasks in numerical linear algebra um, which are important for machine learning in particular. Um, and then we'll become a li little more practical and we'll see um, that implementation of a lot of mathematical operations matters quite a lot, and you can make quite a lot of errors there. Um, and see some practical example where we'll see how to implement Gaussian process regression uh, properly, in a way. All right, so let's get started. Um, first of all, let me start by saying that numerical linear algebra is absolutely central to machine learning. Um, it's probably one of the most fundamental uh, sets of tools in your machine learning toolbox that you need to implement these algorithms. And you can probably already see that by sort of this multitude of different areas uh, on the slide. Once you see all of these together, you probably know that the concept is quite important. Um, just a quick note here, I'll flash some examples at you now. It's not important to understand all of them in detail, it's just to motivate a little bit what we'll be doing today. So let's start with um, yeah, basic probability theory. So here already, where we look at the um, probability density function of a multivariate normal distribution, we already see two quite important parts of today's lecture, namely, for one part, the, the inverse right here of the covariance matrix, and the determinant here. And these are probably, um, yeah, the, the, the two concepts we'll cover most today. So yeah, you already have these two here. Uh, maybe a more, uh, in some sense, more practical example is uh, a general linear model, which if you attach, well, it's, it's, a, it's essentially just a, a linear hypothesis class of, of functions that you use in regression, right? And if um, you attach a square loss to that and then solve um, the accompanying uh, optimization problem in closed form, we also see that there's a, a matrix inverse popping up here, but it's not just some matrix, but the matrix actually has quite a lot of structure in that it is an outer product of two matrices, in a sense. Um, it's reasonably large, depending on the number of features you're actually using, and it's symmetric and positive definite. So we're going to talk a lot about how we're um, exploiting structure to make numerical linear algebra um, algorithms fast and reliable, specifically in machine learning. Um, yeah, you, you can just see, you know, what the, what the model produces with some data set uh, using polynomial feature functions. Um, another quite, I guess, well-known um, base case of a, of a machine learning algorithm is principal component analysis, um, where sort of the, the core of it is to compute what's called a truncated eigen decomposition, so a factorization of the covariance matrix the data covariance matrix here, into three matrices where essentially these, these three matrices also have some, some prescribed structure. Um, and we can also see another very fun fundamental operation in numerical linear algebra and machine learning, which is matrix vector products. It's very, you know, almost, uh, uh, it seems almost too simple, but there's quite a lot of, um, meet here to be discussed today, I guess. And this, what this essentially does, this algorithm, is it does dimensionality reduction. So it takes a high dimensional data set and in this case finds a linear subspace, so a lower dimensional vector space to embed this data set in, which still captures a lot of structure of the data. And you can see that here being applied to pictures of, of faces. And then these images here are essentially seeing these pictures as vectors in a vector space, the, the basis vectors of that lower dimensional vector space, where here we are reconstructing these two images 
with successively more elements from that lower dimensional subspace. Um, why is it not? No, oh, there we go. Um, the main subject for today will arguably be, uh, arguably be the model of a Gaussian process. Um, we're going to talk about this in a lot more detail, but just the quick version here. Uh, it's a Bayesian non-parametric method for regression. So, of course, we're going to place a prior over the thing we care about, prior probability measure, which in this case is this Gaussian process. Um, and then we observe some data, which is essentially just evaluations of the, of the unknown function corrupted by some Gaussian noise here. Um, and then we're in, a, in a Bayesian fashion, we're, we're just going to condition this Gaussian uh, process, this probability measure on these observations to retrieve a, a posterior distribution, which in this case is also a Gaussian process, which has some mean and covariance matrix given here. It's not really important about the structures, but also thing to note here is there's inverses here. And again, there's quite a lot of structure in the matrix we're looking at. So this, what's called the kernel gram matrix here, um, we can see that it's generated by a function. So we have uh, what you could refer to as generative information about the matrix, where we have a function that produces every single entry um, of this matrix, which we can leverage to actually make our algorithms a lot uh, yeah, quicker, more efficient, more reliable. And it's also symmetric and positive definite, just as in the Gaussian, uh, multivariate Gaussian density case. So this is something we'll focus on today quite a lot. Return to that a little, in a little bit. Um, let me just uh, say, even though we just show a Gaussian process here, um, a similar version of these, these equations applies to a larger class of models, which are called kernel methods, kernel machines, and I guess the most direct contender in statistical machine learning of this would be ridge regression, if you've heard of that. So even though we talk about Gaussian processes here a lot, these techniques apply to a larger class of models. Something that has arguably just sort of come into machine learning relatively recently, at least with larger attention, is uh, differential equations. And here we're showing the solution of a um, particular partial differential equation, um, which is linear. And linear partial differential equations can be written essentially as linear systems in infinite dimensional vector spaces of functions. Um, so what's usually the matrix in that um, linear system is, is a differential operator, a linear operator, a linear map between vector spaces of functions. And quite a quite common method to actually solve these equations is to take that linear operator equation and discretize the spaces of functions between which the operator maps. So essentially choose finite dimensional bases or choose finite dimensional subspaces of these vector spaces which then turns this, this um, linear operator equation um, into a, just a finite dimensional linear system, which is usually quite large because essentially for every uh, node of one of these triangles here, you get an entry in that matrix. And it's also, again, highly structured and we have generative information available because we know it comes from this infinite dimensional linear system. And this is something we can also, well, discuss that maybe a little bit later on when we actually talk about differential equations, use to, to build specialized algorithms for this sort of a situation. Um, and finally, and this is probably, I, I would imagine everybody has sort of seen variants of this, is uh, optimization also has quite a lot of linear algebra to deal with, namely, essentially every iterative optimization methods for local optimization of, in this case, some loss function L, depending on some parameter theta, um, has a form similar to this right here, where D is a direction in which to step, and M is a matrix that does, essentially does a correction to this. So think about D as, for example, a gradient in just stochastic or just regular gradient descent. And then M could be, for example, the inverse of the Hessian matrix for the Newton method, which converges quite a lot faster, but it's also quite a lot more expensive to, to evaluate this update rule 
in the case where this is a Hessian matrix. There's uh, quite an Im important characteristic, you know, in a sense, hidden in here for these systems in, in machine learning, which is since specifically in deep learning, we evaluate this loss function on a batch instead of evaluating it on the whole data set, there's some stochasticity here. And this propagates onto the gradient, but both the gradient and the Hessian matrix. So in a lot of cases, linear systems and matrices in machine learning are actually noisy. We don't have access to the true matrix with which we want to solve, but we just have a noisy estimate of it. Philip already talked about this last lecture. Um, and this is something we'll just have to deal with. Not today. Um, we're sort of going to ignore them actually for the rest of the lecture too, but this is something to look out for. And the Newton method is just one choice here. So for example, if you choose the uh, inverse of the Fisher information matrix, you get natural, um, natural gradient descent and so on. So um, yeah, this is actually quite ubiquitous, I would say, nowadays. Um, and then the last example is, uh, is deep learning, right? So um, I realize there's already quite a lot of math here. Just, just realize that there's matrix vector products in the definition of a feedforward neural network. Um, then if we do, if you compute gradients on, on these sorts of functions, then what we call uh, backpropagation is essentially just a vector Jacobian product computed in a very efficient way. So there's also a matrix vector product there. Um, similarly, the forward mode of automatic differentiation is just a Jacobian vector product. So Autodiff has quite a lot to do with matrix vector products. Um, and then if we actually move on to Bayesian deep learning, a very common tool um, to, to deal with Bayesian neural networks is the so-called Laplace approximation, where we optimize the loss function of the neural network until we assume at least we find a local minimum of the loss, which under some loss function, uh, assumption of the loss function corresponds to essentially fi finding the maximum posteriori estimate. And then we approximate around that point with a Gaussian distribution. And this approximation involves computing the Hessian of the neural network with respect to its parameters at that maximum posteriori point and then inverting it to obtain a covariance matrix. You're actually going to hear a lot more about this um, in the lecture given by Agostinus. But yeah, you already see linear algebra will already play or also play a role there. All right, so now that we've talked about or you've seen all these methods, again, it's not important to understand all of them. Just you need to realize that these four um, fundamental operations are quite important for machine learning. They appear everywhere. They are in a, lo in a lot of different models, which is on the one hand, matrix vector multiplication. And usually we need quite a lot of those. So they, it should be reasonably efficient, both in terms of computation time and in terms of memory. Um, and you've seen that in deep learning in optimization also, where we need the product of the inverse of the Hessian with the gradient. And in kernel methods, we'll also need that, uh, mostly in the coming two lectures. Um, then, and probably this is what you'd argue, argue think about if you think about linear algebra is the solution of linear systems. Um, we've seen that in the Gaussian density and by extension also in the Gaussian process case and linear regression, also in optimization in Newton's method and so on. Um, to achieve this and also um, to solve tasks like PCA, we'll need what's, what are called matrix decomposition. So yeah. Uh, factorizations of matrices into matrices that have some sort of prescribed structure. For example, a lower triangular and an upper, tri uh, upper triangular matrix. We actually look into this matrix uh, decomposition uh, in a lot more detail later. Then there's something like a singular value decomposition, which you can also use to solve the PCA problem, um, which are essentially orthogonal matrices, U and V, or unitary matrices, and then a diagonal matrix or the QR decomposition, which is an orthogonal matrix and an upper triangular matrix. And we need that. We've seen it in, in PCA. Um, to do GP inference, it's also, we'll see, quite um, efficient to use one of these decompositions. And to do Kalman filtering, which you'll see, I guess, in a couple of lectures. Finally, um, specifically in the Gaussian density case, and also for um, GP regression will need log determinants. And in the specific case of a symmetric positive definite matrix, um, this log of the determinant can be transformed into the trace um, of the matrix logarithm. 
of, of A. Um, in general, it's also sometimes interesting to estimate the trace of just an arbitrary matrix function of the matrix. So a matrix function could be something like a, an exponential of the matrix, something like that. Um, yeah, and we, we'll need that specifically for GP uh, hyperparameter optimization, which we'll also talk about today. All right, now that we've seen that linear algebra is clearly very important for machine learning, let's start with some practical uh, aspects of it. So first of all, efficient matrix vector multiplication. Um, I've already said that it's actually quite important um, how you implement a numerical operation on a computer. And here we just have a very sort of toy example to show you that even with very, very simple tasks where you think, yeah, what could go wrong? There's actually quite a lot that can go wrong. So we're given the, the task of, well, we're given a matrix A um, with dimensions N and K and a vector in R K, actually, that's, no, sorry, N, sorry, that's, that's correct, where N is substantially larger than, than K here. And we're given the task of computing um, essentially the outer product of, of um, A with itself and then multiplying, uh, multiplying X with that product. Um, yeah, so far so easy for, for the mathematical part of it. These, these sorts of products appear uh, quite a lot, for example, in uh, parametric regression, where you actually choose basis functions, um, and also in PCA, if you want to reconstruct your data in the, the lower dimensional subspace, for example. So this is something that will come across in machine learning, and I guess, you know, you can just write it down. Python is reasonably nice for writing down mathematical expressions, and you can just write it down like this, right? Um, and then we can evaluate it. Boom. Didn't work. What's the problem here? It's actually a little bit hard to read, but does anybody have an idea? What's going on? Hmm? Yeah. Why is it too large, though? Exactly. So what's happening here is Python is, yeah, essentially since we, since we don't set any parentheses here, right, Python has left to right operator precedence, uh, all other things being equal here. Um, and so what it does is it first computes the matrix AA transpose, which is an N by N matrix, and then it multiplies X by that matrix. That's a problem, just you know, some, some back of the napkin math here. 10 to the five times 10 to the five times the, 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 the bit width of the, the data type here is actually 80 gigabytes for this matrix vector product. And that's you know, not really reasonable to do. So what's the, what's the solution here? Exactly. And this reasonably uh, simple fix here, um, yeah, brings that down to much more, much more quick. I mean, you can already see it's like 0.3 seconds to execute, which I'm sure there's a lot of overhead by the notebook it's running. So very, very quick um, implementation, essentially, of this operation, which was impossible to do in the other implementation. So it really matters a lot how you transform a formula, a mathematical expression, into an algorithm. We're going to see quite some examples of that over the course of the lecture, I guess. So the algorithm implementing a mathematical operation has a huge impact on performance, stability, and memory consumption. Um, let's look at a bit more in graphical terms what's going on here, right? You have a, essentially um, what's, what would be called a low rank matrix, right? So you have, uh, by the structure, you have at most rank K in the matrix. And that's sort of going into the direction of identifying what structure in the matrix you're dealing with, right? So we, in, in a sense, we already learned that for low rank matrices, there's a, there's a more efficient way of multiplying with a low rank matrix than just to compute the matrix and then uh, essentially multiply a vector with that, right? Um, in terms of uh, asymptotic notation, you can see that we have a square in here, right? So n squared instead of nk. If n is large, think about either a large data set for regression or um, you know, a PCA on, an, on a two megapixel image, something like that. Um, this is gonna 
hit you quite substantially if you implement it the wrong way. And also, I mean, space was the thing that, that killed us here. So there you can see where that came from. And this brings me to this bigger point of if you know something about the structure in your matrix, generally speaking, the algorithm can't know, but you know. So you should tell the algorithm that you have some sort of a structure in the matrix. And low rank structure is actually, oh, oh, um, low rank structure is actually an example of something that the algorithm, like once you've computed AA transpose, is quite, Im quite expensive to actually figure out post hoc. So if you know you have a low rank matrix, use methods specialized to low rank matrices. Yeah, that's uh, yeah, that's actually kind of a tricky point, right? Because if you if you um, just have the the complete matrix, like the product of the two low rank factors, essentially, then it's quite costly to actually s separate them. But if you like, if you write down your math and you know, well, actually there is low rank structure here. Don't just multiply the matrix out, right? You you if you already have the factors, use them, um, and we'll actually see uh, an example of how to actually do that a little bit later. Um, yeah, and then, I mean, low rank is just one type of structure. There's um, loads of different matrix structures here. There's just a very incomplete list here to show you what I, what I mean by structure. So the base case is, okay, you don't really know anything about what's going on with that matrix. It's just a general matrix to you. And then you can't really get away with, uh, in terms of at least matrix vector products, can't get away with anything quicker than MN in time and space, asymptotically at least. And this is sort of what, like a little bit of a, a pictographic depiction of what that might look like uh, in a specific matrix if you look at the sort of heat map of its entries. Um, we've just seen the low rank matrix and actually for specifically the case um, of low rank plus the diagonal matrix, which then can also be inverted, right? Because low rank matrices are actually singular. You can't invert those. Um, they don't have an inverse, but if you add a diagonal term, which for example, also pops up in regression uh, with, uh, for example, a L2 regularizer. You get this diagonal term with the regularizer weight on the, um, yeah, as it's scaling essentially. Um, you can get away with um, a scaling that's essentially NK, where K is the, the rank of this low rank matrix term. So the, essentially the smaller dimension in the example we just saw. Um, sparse matrices depend a lot on the n number of non-zero entries in the matrix. And, and that actually kind of makes sense, right? It's, it's also the scaling you get for mat both matrix vector products and um, the space requirements of these matrix. Depends also a lot on how you represent the sparse matrix. But yeah, we'll actually not talk about sparse matrices too much here, just so you've seen that this is also one of these types of structure we're talking about. Kernel matrices, and we've also seen these already in this, you know, where flashed uh, GP regression at you quite quickly, um, are structured in the sense that you have generative information. So you have the kernel, um, they're positive uh, definite, and they're symmetric. And usually because that's not really useful in terms of time requirements for the matrix vector product, you don't really get any speed ups here, but you can get quite substantial memory savings. Think about N being, you know, 100,000, as in the example we just had, and this is the number of data points in your regression data set, in this case, uh, if you're using kernel methods, then you get 2ND instead of N squared. ID, by the way, is the, the number of dimensions, essentially, the input dimensions of your regressor, the, the function you want to you wanna learn. Um, yeah, and for specific kernel functions, you can maybe already see here that there might be more structure to the matrix um, than you know, just it being kernel matrix. By the way, how do you actually store a kernel matrix such that you get this space scaling, this space complexity? Anybody know? Yeah, but that, that would just be, you know, half n squared, right? So n squared, after all. Yes. So this is, memory-wise, it's 
obviously loads cheaper. I mean, it also depends on what D is, right? So if your input dimension is loads bigger than the number of data points you have, then this obviously doesn't work anymore. But yeah, so this is exactly how you do it. You store the data points and you, you know the function which generates the entries of the kernel matrix. And so you just you know, evaluate it while you compute the, the, the matrix vector product. And there's actually libraries for that um, which do exactly this thing and you know, uh, realizing it very efficiently, also using GPUs and writing very efficient CUDA kernels for this sort of thing, um, which then enables you to compute you know, Gaussian processes on essentially hundred thousands of data points on a laptop, which obviously takes quite a, still a, quite a lot of compute time in the general case, but at least you don't get memory overflows anymore. Uh, and finally, there's matrices with more general functional form. Think about something like uh, autodiff graphs here. So the, the, essentially the Jacobian chain rule you apply when you, when you uh, do backprop through a, through a neural network. Um, and in general, these are also, you know, can be relatively unstructured and you, you kind of need the same uh, time and space requirements here. But if you put specific assumptions on the compute graphs you deal with, then you might be able to save some time here and, and compute th these, these things those quicker and also the matrix vector products incidentally. All right, so now to a concrete algorithm and um, we're gonna start a sort of line of um, methods here that apply or that are usually apply to Gaussian process regression also in the next two lectures. So we're gonna focus on this a little bit. Just you know, recall that this applies to other kinds of methods and you can transfer what you learn from these methods to other algorithms too, notably kernel ridge regression if you just compute the, essentially the, the, the posterior mean of a Gaussian process. All right, so in a little more detail, um, our goal is to learn an unknown function, uh, F star from a d-dimensional input space, in this case over the reals, but it doesn't actually really matter what, what input space you have as long you know, um, as you, can, you, you have a kernel on it. Um, and then a scalar valued function here can also um, extend that, but let's just keep it uh, relatively simple for now. And then since this is a, a Bayesian regression um, method, we place a prior on the thing we don't know, in this case the unknown function. So this is a probability measure over functions. I already said that. It has a mean function, mu, and a kernel function, which is the covariance of that Gaussian measure, essentially, between two points of, of, the, um, of the unknown function. Um, and then we have a likelihood, which essentially tells us how we got our data from um, the unknown function, how we observe the, the unknown function. In this case, we just add um, homoscedastic uh, Gaussian noise to all of the uh, to all of the data points, um, which are just evaluations of the functions, and we observe a couple of these um, function values y under this noise. And then if we essentially apply Bayes' rule um, to this combination of prior and likelihood, we get a posterior measure, posterior process uh, over the function, given that we observe these data in an experiment. Um, and these are the, the moments, so the, the posterior mean function, the posterior covariance function. Um, yeah, and this is sort of what it looks like, right? You get a, you get a mean estimate, which um, under some assumptions is essentially the same you get from kernel ridge regression. Um, and you have, a, uh, in this case, we just plot the, the marginal um, credible interval, so essentially twice the marginal standard deviation of that process, um, which predicts how uncertain your regression estimate is about the unknown function you're looking for. And you know, in this case, it works you know, reasonably well. The, the, the true function is plotted in this dashed gray line here. Um, and the, with essentially, since you take twice the standard deviation uh, with 96 point whatever percent um, confidence, the, well, the, the, the process predicts um, this true function, this true unknown function in its 95% confidence interval. So that's quite good. It works, the, the uncertainty quantification works reasonably well here. Um, but there's a bit of a problem here since we need to compute this inverse. And I guess we already talked about this uh, in the last lecture. This scales quite prohibitively. Can somebody recap how, how much it costs to do this naively in a sense? To compute a, 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 a 
kernel gram matrix from n data points, where n is quite large. You O N3, yeah, exactly. So it's cubically expensive, and that's just prohibited. I mean, you already saw um, that it might be difficult to compute N square for large um, data sets, so there's that. Um, yeah. Another thing we need to solve for Gaussian processes, though, is you can, well, I mean, I, I've sort of hidden it here, but there's usually parameters to this kernel. There's the output scale, which is essentially how wide this, um, this interval is. Um, there's a length scale, which, which uh, usually a length scale, which sort of says how quickly the prior assumes the function to vary. So how, how, how high the frequency is essentially here, or the frequencies are. Um, things like this. And these are hyperparameters of the algorithm. We need to do some sort of hyperparameter tuning or solve a, a model selection uh, problem. And to do that, there's a uh, the, the, a Bayesian way to do this is to just compute oh, shit. the um, what is going on to just compute the um, what's called the the log marginal likelihood. So what that is is essentially yeah um, the the probability of the data y the the observed data y which are corrupted by noise, as I said, um, given the, the hyperparameter uh, we are essentially trying to, uh, trying to look for. And we're maximizing that because we want our prior to explain the data set we observed um, pretty well, right? So, so um, if we actually try to compute this, we can see that um, by factorizing this um, log marginal likelihood into essentially via, via the, the joint distribution of the noise corrupted um, observations and then just the function evaluation and then integrate over the value of the function evaluation. We exactly arrive at that, that term. Don't worry if you didn't understand that. It's just, this is the, this is the derivation, how, how, you, how you get there. Um, and in the end, you end up after some algebra with the function you can see here which is essentially a loss function you need to uh, minimize now. Well, maximize in this case now. Um, and there's two terms here. So one of them describes the, the model fit, so how well the model actually approximates the data. It comes from the exponent and the Gaussian distribution, so it's essentially, you know, if, if you look at it, it's just that. Um, and then there's another term which comes from the normalization factor of that Gaussian, which essentially, since it's a determinant, it measures a volume of the uh, rows of a matrix. So in this case, what it essentially does is it measures the complexity um, of, your, of your prior, how many functions, the, in a sense, the, the hypothesis class you're, you're positing by that Gaussian prior uh, contain. And these are um, contrasted to each other, right? So there's a, there's a trade-off here. And just to show you an example, here we have quite some severe uh, underfitting, overgeneralizing going on. Um, and what's, uh, what essentially these terms do here, right? You, you fit the data quite poorly. The, the red line is what's, um, what's fitting the data. Well, in this case, does, does not fit the data. And so this term will be relatively la uh, small, sorry, small. Um, but this term, um, will be large, right? Because you, you have a minus here. So there will, there will be a small capacity of the model, minus that is in, uh, at least compared to the model fit term, a relatively large term. So um, yeah, this is one direction of it. And then the other term here is um, yeah, quite some substantial overfitting, I would say. Um, and here the model fit is obviously, in this case, probably perfect. Didn't really check, but it looks like it just fits the points perfectly here because it you know, has all these bumps here to just directly go through the measurement. But then again, the, the, the model that stands behind this, because there's a lot of variation in the function, there's a lot of degrees of freedom essentially, um, yeah, is quite complex. So this term will be large and the negative of it will be quite small. So you need to find a trade-off between these two. And here, 
the log determinant shows up again, right? So we need to compute, in order to do Gaussian process uh, regression, we need access to um, the solution of a linear system. And in this case, actually, not just one solve, but m plus one solves, where m is the number of uh, data points at which we want to evaluate your regressor afterwards. Can you see where that comes from? From here? Anyone? So obviously one solve is here, right? So it's, it, this is a vector of observations. So we need to solve this vector, well, solve this system. So this matrix times some, uh, let's say W should equal this, one solve. And then if we evaluate the posterior process at M points, then we need to evaluate the posterior covariance for these M points. So there's uh, M right-hand sides here. For one x, this is just one linear system, but if there's n, m of these points, we need to solve it m times. All right. Um, now, I've been preaching that structure is very important. What structure do we have here? Just to recall it. In the, oh, shit, it actually says it already, sorry. <laughs> so it's symmetric and positive definite in the most general case, but there might be additional structure, which we should also leverage because the system is huge. And we usually can't solve this, um, at least for extremely large data sets, just like that. Um, and there's also just generative information which you can leverage to push down on the, on the memory consumption a little bit. All right, so how do we do this? Do you know any algorithms that might apply here? We have already heard, I think, last time what one of them is. What's the base case? How should you implement this? I believe somebody last time said Cholesky. So this is the way we're gonna go here. But first, since Cholesky is already sort of a special case of another algorithm, we talk about the more general class of matrix decompositions and one very important matrix decomposition in particular, which is the so-called LU decomposition. So first of all, pretend that the system we're trying to solve is a lower triangular matrix, so only the like essentially the entries on the diagonal and below the main diagonal of the matrix, in this case we're looking at a square matrix, um, are actually non-zero. And you probably already know an algorithm from school which actually does this, um, maybe not in this name, but it's called forward substitution. And we're gonna introduce it in a divide and conquer fashion. So pretend you already know how to solve linear systems of size n minus one, where the, the system matrix is lower triangular. Just assume we already know that, you know, divide and conquer. We're gonna show how to use this knowledge, essentially, how to, uh, to solve a system n by n, instead of n minus one by n minus one. So if we have a lower triangular system, oh shit, this is, would actually be useful to have a pointer now. Okay, I don't know what's going on. Is that something? Um, pretend we already have this, um, we, we have, a, have a lower triangular system. Well then, what we can do is, we can decompose the matrix into four parts, um, which is, um, we take the scalar in the, in the lower right corner, then the column above that will be zero, right? Because it's lower triangular. So the, this is the last entry of the main diagonal. Um, then there will be a vector, a row vector left to that, and then another tr triangular part, in this case it's called L min uh, Li minus one above it. And this is also, as I said, lower triangular. We can do the same thing with the vectors. So Y is the solution of our system, and B is the, um, the right-hand side vector. Does it work now? Ah, there we go. Um, B is the right-hand side vector of the system, and we, we decompose them in the same way. Right? We just split off the, the last entry of it. Well then, we want that Ly equals B, essentially. So if we multiply this out with this decomposition, um, we get that 
li minus 1 times yi minus 1 plus 0 times this, right, is supposed to equal li minus 1, uh, is it supposed to equal bi, bi minus 1. And we, we said that, we, we, or we assumed that we can already solve systems where the system matrix is uh, lower triangular, which have dimension n minus 1. So this, because we split off the last row, has dimension n minus 1. So we can just solve that. We, ha we, we, we have some magical algorithm to do that for now. Um, so this, is, th uh, this way we can figure out what uh, yi minus 1 is. And then we look at the, the last entry, or the last row essentially of the system, which is li minus 1 transpose times yi minus 1, lambda i times gamma i, and this is supposed to equal beta i. Now, I said we already know yi minus 1, but uh, just by you know, decomposing the matrix, we know this vector, and we know these two. Well, actually, sorry, we, we know these two, lambda and beta. We just don't know this. So we rearrange the equation in terms of yi, arrive at this, and under the assumption that we know how to solve li minus 1, yi minus 1 equals bi minus 1, we can solve this system. And now we just apply essentially the same decomposition to the smaller matrix all the way down until we reach the scalar case. Until there's just you know, a scalar left, which is like a one by one matrix, which is essentially a lower triangular matrix, right, in a, as a trivial case. Um, and there we can just divide, right? This is how we solve a one dimensional linear system. So now we just go back up essentially and insert this into the expression um, yeah, and we solve that system recursively by divide and conquer. Um, this is one of these situations where you need to understand recursion to understand recursion. So um, maybe go over this a little bit at home if you didn't understand right now. Um, it takes some getting used to sometimes, I would say. Um, oh yeah, so, ah, shit, I already showed it. So how expensive is it? It's, it's n squared, right? Because in every iteration or in every, in, on every step of the recursion, um, you need to compute this formula here, essentially, where this is the dominating part. So this needs, um, because um, sort of when i is set to n, this needs um, n minus 1 um, multiplications and n minus 2 additions to compute this term. And then if we add them up for sort of varying i, um, you can use a summation formula here and, and arrive at uh, n squared. And this, is, this, this notation is supposed to say to leading order, which means we forget everything that is uh, of less order than n squared. So if there's a linear term in there, we forget about it because it doesn't really matter if n grows large. It's a little bit different from, from O notation because we actually look at the constant of, on the leading term. So there's the, there's the difference there. Um, and you can do exactly the same thing if the matrix is upper triangular. Just you do it in essentially the opposite direction, right? You, instead of splitting the last uh, term off here, you split the first one off and then do exactly the same uh, recursion you did here. And these two techniques are called forward and backward substitution um, respectively. They're also, you already noticed that loads cheaper than inverting just the full matrix. We already heard that's in general O of n cubed. This is, all, uh, this is yeah, also O of n squared, but yeah, lead to leading order n squared. Um, but we don't have a lower triangular system. There's a little bit of a caveat there. So how do we get to a lower triangular system? Um, and this is exactly where what I call the LU decomposition comes in, right? We split the matrix into a lower triangular, uh, in, into a product of a lower triangular matrix and an upper triangular matrix. And this is actually possible for square matrices if they're invertible. So let's look, about, uh, look at how we do this. And it's essentially a very similar construction. Um, we're also using essentially uh, divide and conquer or recursive definition here, right? So assume we can already decompose a matrix A in, uh, of shape n minus 1 times n minus 1. We have a magical algorithm to do that. How do we decompose a n by n matrix in this case, yeah, let's call it AI or A1 in this case here, um, such that we also get this, this factorization into a lower and an upper triangular part. Again, we're just going to split off 
essentially a scalar here and then a column, sorry, a row vector and a column vector here, and then there's a remainder, uh, n by n, n minus one times n minus one matrix here. Um, and we also do this essentially to what will be the lower and upper triangular factor in the end. So um, assume there is such an, a lower triangular factor and an upper triangular factor. This is what it sh should look like, right, at least here, because you can also decompose this in essentially the same way. And because it's uh, lower triangular, you know that this uh, row vector here will be 0. Now, we choose the, the diagonal entries of the, of the left part, of the lower triangular part, to be 1. We can just do that. We'll see uh, in a little bit. And then there will be, essentially, for now, an arbitrary column vector here. Um, and on the right-hand side, we just use, essentially, the same row as the, the upper triangular part here. So we just copy that over. Um, but then, also, here will be a 0 block. And this will also not be equal to b, right? Because this thing needs to be upper triangular. Now we want this decomposition to hold. So if we actually multiply Li times Ui, we get the following equations. We get for the first row um, of the matrix, we just get alpha i times alpha i zero essentially times one zero. So this will be just alpha i in the upper left hand corner. This is already good because it needs to be alpha i. And then it's going to be ui essentially, or an entry of ui times 1, and the, the other part, so the, the, the lower part here zeroed out. So it, the first row of li ui is by construction the first row of a. So that's already good. We just need to pay attention to the, the essentially lower block of it, the, the, the lower rows. Um, for the vector li, we find that alpha i times li must be bi for this to match in the, in the matrix product. And by just rearranging term, we can see that we need to choose Li as Bi divided by alpha i. And then for the sort of the, this, 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 uh, this block in the lower right-hand side, we get Li in outer product with Ui transpose, so Li times Ui transpose, um, and then Li plus 1 times Ui plus 1. Since we, don't, since we already know what Li and Ui are, we need to find out what Li plus 1 times Ui plus 1 are and essentially apply the factorization here. But we know that it needs to be equal to Bi. So Bi needs to be equal to Ui, uh, sorry, Li times Ui transpose plus Li plus 1 Ui plus 1. And we, if we rearrange terms here, we will see that Li plus 1, Ui plus 1, needs to be equal to this thing here. Now, we already assumed that we can decompose a smaller matrix, so an n, by, uh, n minus 1 by n minus 1 matrix, um, into a lower triangular and upper triangular part. Right? This is, again, this recursion step we're doing here. So if we were to factorize this in this way, we would be done, right? We have this decomposition if we use our magical algorithm here. And the magical algorithm is just to, ex to uh, use the same routine all the way down until we reach the scalar case again, where since we set the diagonal entries to one, this is trivial, right? We just, like, if, if, the, if, the, if A is one by one, then we just, as L, take one, and as U, take the entry of A you want to get. Then we're done. So this is what's called the LU decomposition. Um, can you guess how much that costs to compute? Or can you reason about it? Yeah, but uh, yeah, so it's n cubed. There's actually, it's, uh, for, also for the homework, it will be reasonably important to see what the constant in front of that is, because there's some gains to be there. But you essentially, oh, sorry, actually, I forgot that. So obviously, something can go wrong here, right? We're dividing by something, and we don't have any constraint of, on what the values of alpha i can be. It can be 0. So what we do in the case where, where alpha i is 0, um, this alpha i element is usually called a pivot. Um, we can just swap uh, rows in the matrix until we find an element that is non-zero to, to, to divide by. Um, and um, this is called partial pivoting in numeric speak. So if you read that somewhere, this is what that is. Um, and usually, as a heuristic for this algorithm to be sort of 
stable, so, so robust to, to noise, essentially. Um, you choose the, the entry in the remaining rows you need to look at, which has the largest absolute value. So that essentially, you know, you, you don't get huge error amplification here by dividing by a small noisy value and just blows up. Um, and by that, you can actually show, I mean, this is kind of a constructive proof of that, that this decomposition always exists if the matrix is invertible. So that's cool. And for the, for the computation time of this, um, we need to, again, just look at this, right? Because this is an O of n iteration. We just divide a vector by a number for, for sort of, well, actually, i of i, maybe, or n minus, uh, n minus i, uh, rather. Um, so this is, the, this is the biggest part at each um, recursion step. And this, is, this matrix has size n minus 1 um, times n minus 1, right? Because you, in the i step, you've already cut off i entries of the, of the uh, original matrix. Um, and you need um, to compute this, to, to compute the outer product, you need um, n minus 1 square multiplications to compute every entry of that. And then the subtraction itself is also n minus 1 squared operations, because it's that many numbers you need to uh, subtract. And that way, you get a summation over 2 times n minus 1 squared. And if there's a summation formula for the squares of numbers, essentially, by doing like an index shift thing here, you see that to leading order, you arrive at 2 thirds n cubed. Um, with some structure in the matrix, you can push that down uh, quite a lot. And you're going to see how much in the exercises. Um, yeah, so that's our UD composition. Uh, maybe some of you noticed uh, the, the, the strategy we choose here is essentially we subtract the row U from all rows below it um, to compute this upper triangular matrix. And this is exactly what some of you might know as Gaussian elimination. So this is a very, um, in a sense, efficient, and, and we'll also see that it's a um, clever way of doing Gaussian elimination to solve linear systems. Um, uh, since we actually choose these, these upper, uh, sorry, these diagonal entries to be one here, we don't really need to store them, right? We just know they're one. So we can save some memory here, and this is actually um, how you implement this sort of algorithm. Um, you can do it in place, essentially. You, you compute the LU factorization inside the array um, you give, uh, in which you give A to the algorithm, because you always only touch sort of the outer this outer part of the matrix, and um, of course modify this part, but you can but you can store L and U in the same matrix essentially. Um, and I'm actually going to show you with a with an example how that looks like. So um, let's start with some matrix. I'll keep it small so that we actually can do it in this lecture. Uh, so it's 1, 2, 2, 4, 4, 2, and 4, 6, 4. All right. Now, our goal is to um, essentially always um, or uh, arrive at a matrix where these three entries contain the non-trivial part of L. So write the L without the, the, one on the, the ones on the diagonal, because they are implicitly there. And um, this upper triangular part will contain u, essentially, uh, uh, minus the zero parts, yeah? Yeah, that's actually a problem. We don't really have a better marker. Let's see if the green one works better. Is that better? Yeah. OK, cool. <clears throat> All right. Um, and we'll, we'll uh, essentially keep everything in the same memory buffer. So write ev like keep everything in this matrix, essentially. OK, so first step we can see here is we keep the first row, because the first row will be, the, in this case, the first row of u also. So we just copy over um, 1, 2, 2. Next, we need to compute this L, Li. Um, and it's just you know dividing 
the, the, the B vector, which is this vector right here in this decomposition, by that, sorry, by that entry. And it, since it's one, you know, it's just, a, it's just the same vector here. All right. So now we've computed almost every quantity at this stage of the recursion. Um, we just need to compute bi minus li ui and then apply the same algorithm on that again. But you can see here, we don't need these entries of, of a anymore once we've computed bi. And we have exactly the right amount of space to fill that in. So we're just going to compute it in here, essentially. And uh, that will be, um, so the first entry of it is um, li, so the first entry of li, 4 times 2, the first entry of ui transpose. And then we're going to subtract that from bi, which is 4, right? So minus 4. Then it's going to be 4 times 2, subtract that from 2, minus 6. 4 times 2, 8, subtract that from 6, minus 2. And then 4 times 2, subtract it from 4, it's minus 4. So now we've, we've essentially done the i equal 1 step of the algorithm. We, um, the, the next step would be to uh, is essentially recurse, right? Apply the same trick or the same algorithm to just this 2 by 2 square here. And with that, we actually already terminate then because we already arrive at the, the scalar case. So we, we just copy these, right? Because we, we don't touch this part of the memory buffer in this step. And then we copy that because we take uh, ui transpose also as the first row, essentially, of ui and the alpha. So it's minus 4 is the alpha. And then minus 6 is the u. Um, we divide. Um, the bi entry essentially by the alpha. Um, so we get 0.5. And then um, it's going to be bi, so minus 4, minus li uh, times ui. And in this case, this is just the number uh, 6. So this is minus 3, and then minus minus 3 is 3. So uh, minus one here, and now what we have is in the in these upper entries, we have the u, we we needed to compute, and in these lower three entries we have uh, all but the diagonal of L. So this is how LU decomposition is computed. Uh, also, if you just call uh, LU factor in SciPy, this sort of leaves out this this pivoting, the pivoting itself. Um, you know, would also be um, implemented by swapping around the rows if you needed to. In this case, we didn't need to really. Um, but this amounts to the decomposition just uh, getting another uh, matrix P to the left of L and U, which is a permutation matrix, which just, you know, swaps back the rows essentially, which, which performs that swap, which, because swapping rows is a linear operation, so you can represent it as a matrix. All right. Um, so now we know this decomposition, but what do we do with it? So we know how to invert triangular linear systems. Um, so what we do is, you know, since A is um, now equal to LU because we constructed the LU decomposition that way, we just write instead of AX equal B, LU, uh, LUX equal B, which is two linear systems essentially. So it's, we, we need to solve for some Y such that L and y is equal to ux in this case, equal b, and then we solve the second linear system. Luckily, both of these are base cases, which we already know, which is you know, backward and forward substitution, respectively. So we can compute those. And what's nice about this is once we've computed the LU decomposition of a particular matrix A, we can very efficiently solve multiple linear systems with multiple right-hand sides for that matrix um, A. Right, because we, we only once need to spend the two thirds n cubed to compute the decomposition, but then for every additional linear system that we need to solve, it just costs two n squared for once forward, once backward substitution. If you're wondering if there's a matrix P 
um, here, which is a permutation matrix. The inverse of a permutation matrix is just this transpose. It's an orthogonal matrix, so it's also extremely cheap to compute that. Uh, you can actually do it in linear time because it's very sparse. So even in this case, you can still invert here. And then for k solves of, with the same system matrix A, which is exactly what we're doing in Gaussian process regression, right? We have the same system matrix, the gram matrix, and we just solve m plus one systems with it. Um, we just pay cubically and then 2kn squared for k linear systems. So that's a very, very um, efficient way of solving multiple linear systems with the same matrix, um, which you could say is amortizing costs here. So that's just one, essentially one task left that we need to do, which is the compu uh, computation of the log determinant. Um, but it turns out you can actually also do that with an LU decomposition. So the determinant of a matrix A, anybody know how much it costs to compute that directly, like without knowing any structures about A? Well, yeah, exactly. It's also cubically expensive as much as uh, inverting the system because so the naive way of doing it is Gaussian elimination too. So yeah. Um, since we know, assuming that we know an LU decomposition, we can just say, well, the determinant of A is the same as the determinant of LU. Determinants distribute into products, so it's the product of the two determinants of the two matrices. And then we can use the fact that essentially you can see that via like Laplace expansions or also Gaussian elimination that the, pro the determinant of a either lower or upper triangular matrix, holds for both, is just the product over the diagonal entries. It's just a linear algebra effect that you can check that by different means, right? And so this means given an LU decomposition, we can actually compute the determinant in linear time. So we only need to compute one object which is expensive, which is cubically expensive, and then solve all other problems from that structure. It's a very efficient way of representing um, a linear system such that you can, well, a matrix, such that you can do all sorts of interesting linear algebra tasks with it. All right. Questions so far? Cool. So I've been hammering on this point that, that we need to use structure in order for our algorithms to be efficient, right? And we have structure that we didn't use yet, which is the fact that our kernel gram matrix is actually um, positive definite or symmetric and positive definite, right? Um, there's a specialized version of the LU decomposition, which is called the Cholesky decomposition, um, which uses exactly that fact, and it uses it to make the algorithm faster. Again, how, how much faster you see in the exercise. Um, where we is essentially do the same construction, so it's basically all the same. Instead of using once on the diagonal here, we use the same values for both, which then means that, you know, since we want the matrix to be symmetric, um, it needs to be the square root here. And so then we, al we also use the same factor for left and right, right? Because we, if we know it's um, symmetric, then we can use, just use the same factor to encode that symmetry, essentially, in our decomposition. But other than that, you ex essentially get exactly the same formulas here. Um, and the fact that you can actually take this root here, you don't need to do any pivoting. Because you know if it's strictly positive definite, all the essentially um, the inner products, by definition, with the um, unit vectors are positive, strictly positive. And these are amount to uh, exactly these entries. So you don't need pivoting in this case, because it will just go through. And by giving that algorithm, you also essentially gave the, pr the proof that a Cholesky decomposition exists and is unique for all uh, positive, strictly positive definite matrices uh, and this is, of course, what we should use, because it's, I already teased it, it's faster. How much faster is he? Um, but this is sort of the go-to tool to solve GP regression, at least in small scales, because it has all these nice properties. It obviously um, inherits a lot of the properties of LU, and some of, some, some of them are even much nicer. Um, so again, here's the moments I've been flashing at you for quite a bit now. Now we're actually going to solve them. So as I said, we use Cholesky decomposition. So we compute uh, the Cholesky uh, decomposition of this um, kernel gram matrix. 
Um, the kernel matrix in this case looks like this, and then the Cholesky decomposition of it looks like this. Um, it's, of course, the same factors, uh, just transposed. And then we, we're going to insert this LL transpose in place of the, the, kernel, um, the kernel gram matrix here. And since matrices flip order, if you sort of drag the, the inverse into a product of matrices, you arrive at this thing here, which means that for, to obtain the posterior mean, you need to solve one system by forward substitution, right? This is lower triangular, so it's forward substitution and one system by backward substitution because this is upper triangular, and then essentially do the same thing for the um, covariance here. Um, there's something to note here about these factors. How would you sort of describe this structure you can see here in the covariance, or in the, in the Cholesky factors of the covariance matrix? Any ideas? It's a bit difficult because I didn't put the scale here, right? But And that would, what kind of structure would that Im sort of at least approximately impose on the matrix itself? What? Ah, oh, sorry. Uh, so you said maybe the first three columns, right, approx maybe approximate the matrix already quite well. So what type of structure would that, like, how, exactly. So there might be, and I'll show you in, in what sense there, there is actually that low rank approximation, a good low rank approximation to this matrix already. All right, questions? So yeah, that's what you get from that. Uh, I guess I already showed you that plot before. Now, uh, yeah, we can sort of see the result of our work here. Um, and specifically to compute the log determinant, which you need in an optimization loop to find the optimal hyperparameters of that, that model. So you need that also quite, quite often, incidentally. Um, you can just use that formula I gave you earlier. So the log, determin the log determinant of this thing is the log of the determinant of the LU decomposition, which I just showed you is just the product over the two um, diagonals of the two matrices. And you can just drag in the logarithm into the product and see, well, actually, I just need to compute one diagonal, obviously, because it's the same factor and just you know, uh, double it, essentially. We still have a problem, though. We already see, uh, saw in, in, in the earlier slides that a matrix, assuming that our data set is 100,000 data points, um, meaning that our kernel matrix is actually 100,000 times 100,000, is not going to fit in memory. So what do we do here? And there's a couple of different ways of approaching this. That doesn't mean we can't use Gaussian processes in these cases. We just need to take more care in how we use linear algebra to solve these problems. Um, and I'm going to show you two maybe not contrary approaches, but two different approaches to solving this. And Jonathan is going to continue the next two lectures which, with much more detailed uh, descriptions of methods that you can actually use here. So first of them is structure. So um, we, can, we can just use structure we have in the kernels we employ um, to in, uh, invert the system much, much quicker. Um, and this usually boils down to choosing specific kernels which are sort of amenable to, to um, linear algebra, essentially. One of the examples here is uh, just using a parametric prior. So instead of having a Gaussian process, which is essentially infinitely many features, if you, if you will, or as many features as you have training data points, you can just choose uh, a finite number of well, p features uh, here, where p is, in comparison to the data set, reasonably small. Um, and then use these kernels. And th what this amounts to, this, this, this structure of these kernels, is just you say you have some, um, some Gaussian, multivariate Gaussian prior on some, some, some weights, some essentially what are coordinates in a, function, in a finite dimensional function space. Um, and then you, you, you use these as to, to, weight, uh, to, to, sorry, to weigh the different um, feature functions with one another in a linear fashion. And this is, you know, by applying the rules of, of linear Gaussian inference here, you, you see that with this construction, you, you're essentially getting this mean and kernel function. So this is the GP analog of uh, linear regression uh, as compared to ridge regression. 
um, yeah, and then you're obviously also going to get um, the, this essentially the same form of a posterior, but now the uh, kernel gram matrix looks like this. What structure does that have? So remember, uh, p is a lot smaller than n, and this means that obviously sigma is p times p. And the, the training set features are n times p, so phi x here. Just draw it. So this product um, is essentially a, a tall matrix times a small um, the square matrix and then a wide matrix. Exactly. This is low rank cross diagonal. So here we see a real world example of where we uh, we get low rank plus diagonal uh, matrices in a in a machine learning algorithm. But we o we only know how to multiply with that matrix efficiently. Um, we need still need to figure out how to invert these matrices efficiently. And the t um, the actually yeah. So sorry. Before I start with that, um, a possible choice here is. I uh, generated, well, uh, this is a ge data set generated from a uh, sinusoidal function, from a sine with a specific frequency, uh, corrupted by some, some Gaussian noise. And obviously, if I know there's a sinusoidal, well, like Fourier structure, essentially, in my, in my data set, I can just use a finite Fourier basis, ba basis for this. So this is, I think, uh, ten, the 10 first, or some of the 10 first Fourier features essentially sines and cosines with different frequencies, like increasing frequencies, starting from sine itself and then always doubling frequencies, I believe. So you get a reasonably good fit also from a non-parametric model here because you know something about your data set. And um, this essentially comes from the um, generative structure, right? If you know um, you have a periodic data set, something that comes from a, from a periodic uh, latent function, essentially, um, you can choose kernels, which um, on the one hand, reflect that knowledge modeling-wise, but also are extremely efficient in terms of computation. So there's a fusion, essentially, of modeling and computation here, which already hints at some of the core messages of the lectures, I guess. All right, so how do we actually invert that system? It's still an n by n system, so if you just threw LU on there, it would be n cubed. We wouldn't win anything, right? But I said, Essentially, you shouldn't uh, multiply just these factors together and just throw it in a, in a generic solver which doesn't know anything about the structure. And a tool you can use here is the so-called matrix inversion lemma. Um, this, I realize this is quite a, quite a bit of math here, but hang on. It's actually reasonably simple to understand what's going on. So what the matrix inversion lemma essentially says is if you had, have a matrix A and you add a bit of a disturbance to it, you, you perturb it in in a low rank matrix in just a very small number of its, of its uh, uh, subspaces, essentially, the subspace that it's, it's constructed of, um, then the inverse of that perturbation will be the inverse of the matrix A minus also a bit of a perturbation. And the key thing to notice here is this matrix, if C is P times P, so C is sigma essentially here, then this matrix is a P times P inverse, and p is lo a lot smaller than n in, in our case here, usually. So this means that once we have computed v transpose a inverse u, which is a np squared operation, you can check that, um, then assuming that we know how to invert a efficiently, and it's, it's essentially trivial to invert a diagonal matrix, it's just you know, the, uh, the, the same diagonal matrix with the scaling factor inverted, um, we can evaluate this expression also very efficiently, in this case, O n p squared, right? Because the p is a lot smaller than the n, we would have n p squared plus p to the third. So the p to the third just vanishes, in this case, into the cost of computing this thing here. Which makes this feasible, and what's um, quite cool about this is we also don't actually need to form this whole matrix in memory. So we also don't have the same memory costs to invert that system. We don't even need to form the matrix. 
this is just one way of uh, using structure. Um, there's many different approaches to this, many, many specific kernels which lead to uh, um, essentially kernel gram matrices that are very amenable to, to linear algebra uh, operations. Um, we're actually going to hear uh, about a particular form later in this lecture, which is Kalman filtering. For very specific kernels, you can express Gaussian inference as Kalman filtering and compute this thing actually not just in NP squared, but in linear time of the data set. So Natana and Jonathan are going to tell you a lot about this later. Um, and there's all sorts of other linear algebra tricks, which if you're interested in that, just, just ask me, but I'm not going to go over this right now. Um, but yeah, and ah, actually, we also need to compute the determinant, right, in order to do um, hyperparameter optimization. But there's an analog, essentially, of the matrix inversion lemma for determinants, which is called the matrix determinant lemma, which is essentially has, this, has the same cost. So we're good there. Again, determinant of a, of a diagonal matrix is trivial. And then this is, uh, this is again, NP squared to compute. And then these both are P, um, P cubed, so same runtime here. Um, actually, uh, this is, this is uh, one of the names, maybe you've also heard of the Sherman, Morse, and Woodby formula. This is exactly the same thing. The other general approach of scaling GP regression to larger data sets is essentially what I call here approximate inversion. You're going to hear the proper term in the next lectures, but for now, this should suffice. And this goes back to the point we made earlier about maybe the Cholesky factors are essentially a low rank approximation of the matrix. So you can write down the Cholesky algorithm as an iterative algorithm. We did that here. And you can see it's essentially, again, the, the same uh, object, right? There's this, what, what previously was B i minus uh, L i u i transpose in the, in the, um, in the L u decomposition. Um, but an interesting thing to note here is that, um, in a way, you collect information about your system matrix A by multiplying it from the right with a normalized unit vector. Um, and since we iterate over this uh, system 1 to n, what Cholesky does is it processes the data set represented in the kernel matrix um, in a, just in, a, in, a, in an iterative fashion, in, a, in, a, in, a, in the given order, the, the order you give it to the algorithm. And since um, we add rows to the Cholesky factor. You've already seen that, right? We've, we've, um, in, when we did LU here, we first added sort of the, the first column to the Cholesky factor. Um, uh, sorry, to the, to the L factor in the LU decomposition. In the next iteration, we added this one and then this one. So we iteratively construct a low rank approximation to these two factors. In this case, it's the same factor, right? Um, we actually get access to this low rank characteristic, this, this, this low rank approximator to the matrix on the fly. So we don't need to compute the whole Cholesky factorization of our matrix. We can just stop the algorithm. And then we have a low rank approximation of the matrix. How good is it? Depends, right? Depends on the kernel matrix. But um, this general scheme um, we can use to stop the algorithm. And I've actually uh, done that. And, I can show you what the sort of approximate matrices look like. So if we take a dense kernel matrix um, with arguably some, some, some structure here, um, and then just terminate the Cholesky decomposition after one iteration. So this is just an outer product of two vectors here. It's the first L, essentially the, this, this first uh, column right here. Then we just get this. It's quite a poor approximation, I would say. Now, if we add four more vectors, so it's a, then rank four approximation, it gets a little bit better. And it sort of uh, moves, this, this blob up here moves a little bit down or, or, or extends down because that's how we process the data points, right? It, the, the rows in here correspond to the data points. And we just approximate data point by data point, uh, approximate the data set better this way, adding another five gets a little bit better and you know it just creeps all the way down here until this is actually a 30 by 30 matrix. Uh, so it would be uh, the true Cholesky factors at L30. So arguably what you'd call what you could call something like the convergence of this approximation is 
relatively poor. But this is because we process the data points in a linear order. Um, and since the, the sort of the length scale of the kernel actually already, like given a data point, already contains quite a lot of information about closely adjacent data points, the information game from, at, uh, from processing the next data point in the next iteration is relatively low. But we don't explore anything about the, about the space in which we're trying to learn a function. So what you can do is uh, choose the order of the data points in which Cholesky deals with them, um, in which Cholesky approximates the kernel matrix. And that I've done here. So I just pre-multiplied the, the gram matrix with a permutation matrix, which is essentially what's called uh, full pivotization. So you, instead of just swapping rows, you swap rows and columns simultaneously. Um, and this then would be called a pivoted Cholesky decomposition, essentially the analog of a pivoted LU decomposition here, which is, which is uh, what we discussed earlier. Um, and then compute this lowering appro approximation after only four terms. You get this. And this is, looks close to perfect, right? It's very, very close to the full kernel matrix. So here we can actually see that there is arguably some lowering structure in the matrix, which needs to be corrected for it also for it to be uh, full rank, um, which we need to invert it actually. But there's some point to be had here that maybe we don't actually need all those Cholesky iterations if we choose the order of the data points in a clever way. And you could say that this ordering could be considered something like an active learning problem, right? Because after one iteration of Cholesky, you already, already know what your predictor is for the data points and you know how much of the matrix you have explored. So from that information, you can in an online fashion select which data point to observe essentially to, to compute in the Cholesky iteration um, at the next iteration. And um, this can be, th these, these P matrices here can also be essentially constructed in an online fashion so that this is actually possible to, to realize in, in code. There's a question? but you're reordering them. So you would actually, if you ran the algorithm to completion, you would deal with them later. Yeah, yeah, I know. Yeah. So it's like you will subset iteration five, but you are, I mean, the original matrix, matrix you're only uh, working with rows zero, five, ten, for example. Yeah, essentially. Can you repeat what you said? Oh, sorry. Um, so essentially by, by terminating Cholesky early while using a permutation matrix, you're actually skipping rows. But that's, sort of the point, right? Yeah. If you process the first row, you don't want to process the second row because you already have a lot of information about what's happening in the second row. So that's essentially what's, what, what the, the point of this whole business is, yes? So this, the optimal permutation can be like the equal spacing of the, um, of the rows or is there more? Very good question. So the question was whether the optimal uh, permutation is just to sort of cover as much space, I guess, right? So, so, so uh, find essentially an, an even decomposition. And the answer is it depends on the kernel and essentially whether you have a uniform grid or whether your data are scattered, right? So the, 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 in, in some sense, the initial covering, right, the size of these blobs here depends on the length scale of the kernel, about how much you assume, um, uh, the, how, how wide the influence of the kernel function is um, how much it correlates close by points. And then with a shorter length scale, this blob becomes smaller. And th that way you also need a denser covering to get this initial result, right? So it depends on the kernel parameter, but again, generative structure, right? We know a lot of, about the generative structure, so our, our linear algebra algorithms should be informed about the, general uh, the, the generative structure of the matrix they're working with, which classical linear algorithms uh, are arguably not. They're just given an array of numbers. And they can't know that. You need to inform them. And this is also the wider point here, right? So maybe for machine learning, because we look at, we're looking at very, very specific problems, we should design our own algorithms which leverage these information, which maybe there are classical algorithms to deal with that, maybe not, but we shouldn't be you know, just following the canon of given an arbitrary matrix, you should apply that, uh, that method because you can learn a lot from that structure. So I was thinking like, it's pretty cool because for Lesky decomposition, what you're doing is you're matching the top and the, the corners of the matrix, uh, of the matrix of A, mm -hmm. just to win the uh, Cholesky decomposition. So you're, 
churning of the factors by iteratively like going from the yeah. upper left corner. Yeah. While for approximation, you already have a decomposition for that, which is singular value decomposition, where you kind of solve an optimization problem, I guess. I don't know. There might be better ways. Wait, 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 why do we have a SVD given? So I'm not saying you have an SVD okay, given. Yeah. So I'm basically, the point is, when is like uh, uh, Cholesky, uh, when will the Cholesky factors or in the order that they are coming, they are going to be a good approximation for the uh, for the matrix. So the the best approximation would be, or the best factors would be the singular, uh, the factors given by the singular value decomposition, which solves an optimization problem to get all yeah. the information into mm. those factors. So mm. you're kind of doing a heuristic to like, uh, it, it's a little bit different from an, from a singular value decomposition, though, because in a singular value decomposition, you posit, sorry, the question was whether this is actually essentially approximating what a singular value decomposition is doing or truncating an SVD is doing, right? No, no when, when you're applying this heuristic to like get more information into the, because it could be arbitrarily bad, right? Because you, all you're doing is you're matching the first few rows. So you don't know like matching the first few rows will give you really good factors for the matrix. Mm -hmm. but with your heuristic, the way I understood is like you're trying to like get, which is what you were saying, using the spatial structure yep. of getting all that information. Yeah. But like, yeah, I mean, that's got to be some kind of approximate singular value decomposition. Well, I mean, the difference here too, so, so, okay, let me just try to rephrase that again. Um, so the question is whether this has something to do with approximate SVD, right? Whether which, by using that heuristic, trying to approximate the SVD, which is like the optimal thing to do. Yeah. So it, it, um, in this case, we would actually be trying uh, to compute an eigen decomposition essentially, right? Because we have a, uh, um, yeah, we, we, have a, we have a square matrix, we have a symmetric matrix, and in this case, uh, for all intents and purposes, these two are the same, um, and Yes, uh, in some sense, the eigen decomposition is actually the optimal thing to do here, but just note that uh, these rows aren't necessarily orthogonal, which they would need to be for an eigen decomposition. So yes, you're essentially trying to find the eigen directions because these in, in, in some metric, which I'm not really wanting to go into right now, is, are optimal, but you're, you're not taking into account that you would need to orthogonalize these to actually have the the uh, eigen decomposition here, right? So yeah, Th this sort of prevents you from actually finding the eigenvectors because they are, you know they are orthogonal or they form an orthogonal basis of the space, yeah. Any other questions? Actually, one thing I also didn't um, mention yet is there's actually a third thing we need to do to, to, to use Gaussian processes in practice, right? We usually don't uh, you uh, only take interest in the mean and the, the, the variance or the, the, the standard deviation of the process. We also usually want samples from it. And for that, you also need an object which is called a matrix square root. And the Cholesky decomposition is a matrix square root, right? Because it's essentially uh, the same, in a sense, the same matrix just transposed, multiplied with, it, uh, with itself to, to produce the matrix again. And this you need for sampling. Uh, you can look, up, look that up in either the probabilistic machine learning class on YouTube um, or just any textbook. And this low rank sampling could also be useful for that, right? Because even though you can directly invert a low rank matrix, you can at least use it for sampling in an approximate manner, which is also then a lot faster. All right, with that, uh, I actually come to an end here. Just a quick summary. We've seen that numerical linear algebra, uh, algorithms are very fundamental to machine learning. They pop up in almost every machine learning algorithm. Um, and why should we even care about numerics specifically uh, as machine learners? Well, we've seen that implementing this, these algorithms can be a lot faster if you take into account structure. You need to be very careful implementing these algorithms in practice. Um, yeah, we should deal with that. Um, we mostly de dealt with four tasks, which is very efficient matrix vector multiplication, which will also be important for the next two lectures, so keep that in mind. The solution of linear systems, which we've seen loads of examples of over the course of the lecture. We've done that and other tasks by computing a matrix decomposition, learned about LU and Cholesky here. Um, and the computation of log determinants and matrix traces is important to solve hyperparameter optimization problems in Bayesian uh, machine learning. 
we've seen loads of examples of how to use structure, and that structure is really important to get fast algorithms for machine learning. And um, we will continue to see how this structure um, affects Gaussian process uh, regression in particular. Thank you. And that's lecture. Thank you.